Please call the roll. Thank you, Mr. President. Division 1, Shelly Sorcival. Division 2, Keith Dias. Here. Division 3, Frank Donato. Here. Division 4, Justin Lane. Here. Division 5, Robert Harris. Here. Division 6, Martin Barnes. Here. Division 7, Gary Van Dam. Here. Item 4, carried open to the public. If anybody would like to address the board on any item that is not on the agenda, please feel free to do so now. Item 5, presentation on the California water phase. Lane? Yes, uh, I'm uh, pleased to have uh, Jennifer Pierre, who is the uh, general manager of the state water contractors here, to provide a presentation to the board on the California water phase. Uh, she's uh, overseas implementing uh, the state water contractor objectives and overall operations. Uh, she and her staff uh, work to provide technical, legal, and scientific support to the state water contractor members to ensure a sustainable water supply from the state water project. Ms. Pierre has over 15 years of experience with Delta management, including but not limited to restoring, planning, operations, criteria development, and regulatory compliance. She leads uh, state water contractors' participation in guiding and developing the framework for the state's management of water supply and ec ecological issues within the Delta. Additionally, uh, Pierre manages coordination with the California Department of Water Resources regarding statewide water supply management and the programs, policies, regulations affecting the state water project. She holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Environmental Biology and Management from UC Davis, and her most uh, uh, important aspect is she's not an engineer, and as such, uh, she can speak in plain language so that most people can understand what she has to say. And uh, with that, uh, if Ms. Pierre can uh, provide Thank you. That's pretty funny. I do talk really fast, so, so I'll try to slow down. And uh, I've been working on this project for about seven years. So prior to coming to the State Water Contractors, I worked on it almost exclusively. So I know it really well. And if I go in too fast, tell me, slow down. What did you say? I tend to speak fast anyway, but you should hear the rest of my family. <laughs> so let's see. So um, thanks for having me here tonight. Um, beautiful building and happy to be here. Um, we're going to talk tonight about basically the why are you pursuing water fix? Why is the Department of Water Resources going to build it? What is it? What does it look like as we move towards implementation? And then an overview of the recent contract amendment agreement and principle which was um, recently negotiated between the state water project contractors and the Department of Water Resources. So to set the stage, um, what's been happening in the Delta where the State Water Project water is diverted is that there's been increasingly reduced reliability and we expect those um, pressures and reductions to continue because we're seeing continued species and ecosystem declines. We are seeing sea level rise that's occurring and on top of that, a flashier uh, storm. So when water's appearing, it's faster and, and more aggressive and it's not as um, nice and smooth and so it changes how we're able to operate the Delta and there's been a number of seismic risks that have been identified over time so a little over a decade ago the department started looking at what can we do to start to mitigate this and try to um, reverse the re uh, reduction in reliability coming from the state water project. What we're seeing in the Delta right now is that the regulatory environment is always changing and unfortunately it's changing in the direction we don't want it to change. It's getting tighter and tighter and I'll show you um, what that looks like in a moment. But in terms of how we model this, we look at the reliability of the state water project and this is across all of the users. There's 29 state water project contractors. Um, has been, been declining over the last 10 years. And when we look at the potential threats related to regulation and climate change and other factors that are out there, we predict that we'll see continued declines. And so the purpose of, of California Water Fix is to restore the reliability that's been lost and will continue to be lost absent implementation of Water Fix for the reliability of state water project supplies. 
This is a graphical representation of actual allocations from the state water project and, and by percentage allocation. And you can see that in about 2008 and 9, when the Fish and Wildlife Service and the National Marine Fisheries Service issued biological opinions, they substantially reduced the reliability of the state water project. And the reason that that occurred is in part because of the restrictions that were placed on the South Delta export operations. So what we're expecting is that as the regulatory restrictions become stricter and stricter, the yields go down and that causes the cost unit for Table A to go up because you're going to pay by your contract and that the reliability is coming down. And then on top of that, we have this variability related to climate change that, that makes it even diff more difficult to plan. So what the Department of Water Resources is, is proposing to construct is the California Water Fix. It is a 9,000 CFS facility um, consisting of three intakes and two tunnels and a couple four bay um, other pertinent structures. Uh, what's important about it are two things. First of all, it operates as a dual conveyance facility, so the idea is not to stop using the existing export facilities in the South Delta. And I, I, let's see if I can maybe up here. This, no, oh, it doesn't, okay. So where it says Clifton Court pumping plant is where we, approximately where we currently um, export water. Okay, um, here. And what happens is the water moves from the Sacramento River, which is over here, down through the delta, and down to here in the export facilities. And that reverse flow is what the fish agencies have said is a problem. So we thought, OK, well, maybe if we move the intakes up here, to, there's three little dots here that are right along the Sacramento River. And we are able to install more state of the art fish screening technology, and we're able to operate it a little bit more flexibly in combination with our existing facilities. Then we're going to be able to um, to relax some of the restrictions that have been um, reducing our reliability. So the benefits of the California Water Fix is that you do reduce those reverse flow issues and that is one of the major restrictions on the state water project facilities now we have more flexible operations so for example in um, 2017 i believe it was april a portion of the clifton court four bay one of the gates broke and so the department actually had to stop exporting state water projects what is your own record and uh, it wasn't just oracle that had an issue there was other infrastructure and so again having a second point of diversion is um, a redundancy that's typically built in now in many engineering projects that wasn't originally and so it provides that flexibility. It has the ability to be re more resilient to seismic activity and the reason is right now the way the water moves from the north to the south is through levees that were not constructed by the core necessarily and were constructed with a lot of peat soil a um, hundred or more years ago and by putting a tunnel facility deep underground that is built to seismic standards, the potential for disruption to supplies in a seismic event is substantially reduced. There's also the adaptation to climate change, um, in part because the <coughs> North Delta intakes are located higher in elevation than the current North South Delta facilities, but also because of the ability to take that big gulp when there are flashier storms, having that capacity allows us to move and store water when it's available. And there's improved water quality to state water product deliveries because taking water directly from the Sacramento River where the water is less salty is a benefit in terms of the treatment cost to users of state water project water. So um, this graphic is the most overrated graphic that we have on the project. I thought I'd share it with you just for some context. The EIR uh, that was subject to any CEQA action we take tonight includes a very large range of alternatives ranging from um, similar conditions to now with some intakes to <coughs> substantial regulation. And one of the reasons I want to show you this is this is what the state board is looking at. And so it's very plausible that in the future the regulations continue to build as we've been predicting. Uh, the state board's looking at within this range, the initial operating criteria and the permits, 
is in this range, and this is what we basically are, um, is in the CEQA document, the notice of determination. So I just want to show you guys that this is a range and that um, the, this, there are factors out there that can definitely impact, continue to impact the regulatory environment in the Delta, which is one of the main reasons why the water fix is being proposed. So when we look at the yield right now, we say we're at about 61% reliability. We can anticipate in the future that that goes down to about 48%. And one of the ways we got to this number is we started imagining real potential future scenarios. Increased regulation by the fish agencies, increased regulation by the state board, and climate change on a similar um, trajectory as what we've already experienced. And we, all, we get to about the same number. So we don't know that that's for sure. It's definitely a model number. But the, the point of the, this is that what Waterfix says is it restores. And it protects the investments that have already been made in the state water project from any of your further decline. So when you look at Table A combined with Article 21, the improvement goes up to 18%. This is showing this just in a bar graph. So you can see currently um, total South Delta export, so that state water project and Central Valley project combined are about 4.7 million acre feet long-term average if nothing changes. But when we look at these potential future scenarios, we are substantially reduced by about a million acre feet. And what Waterfix can do is to restore that reliability and potentially under some circumstances even improve it. And some of that conclusion is based on this idea that the modeling we typically use is a monthly set, but Waterfix is really able to operate in Taking that bolt when you've got a five-day storm coming on the Sacramento River, you can really pick up that water without having environmental impacts and, and convey that. And so that's where the range comes from that um, right bar. These are the total costs to, for the entire project for the 9,000 CFS. Uh, it's about $65 million annually to the um, users of, of the project. We'll talk about who those are in a second. Right now, the project is um, proposed to be paid for by 67% of it by the South of Delta State Water Project contractors, that would include you. And the remaining 33% Metropolitan Water District of Southern California has said that they would pay for, but it's currently unsubscribed and is really being held um, for use by the CBP when they're ready to come in. Uh, they have different billing issues and contractual relationships with the Bureau of Reclamation, and I, they need to sort those out. But we do, um, we, they don't do support the project, and hopefully they will come in. But the piece for you to be concerned about is that 67% of both the benefit of the project and the cost of the project would be allocated among the 24 South of Delta, um, South of Delta State Water Project contractors. And like I said before, it is equating to about a 13% increase in reliability with Table A and an additional 5% when you factor in Article 21. This is what it looks like in a pie chart. So it protects about 700,000 acre feet of state water project supplies over the long term average for that 67% investment. And that 33% of the subscribe will be constructed so we can maximize operations of the project. Um, and still to be determined exactly who's subscribing to that. This is what it looks like when you break it down. Uh, Metropolitan is still counted as part of the South of Delta on the 67%. So on the left-hand side, you see 33%. Metropolitan has, is um, going to pay for, but um, user, end user is TBD. And on the right, you'll see State Water Project, 67%, South of Delta, Metropolitan still picks up their portion, per, their proportion of the state water project there. I think Dwayne will talk in a minute about the specifics related to any that. So talk, going into project implementation, um, now that we're here, we've got most of the permits, we've got a project, um, DWR is ready to go. Uh, we are creating a um, finance JPA in order to allow bonds to be issued while DWR uh, conducts our validation action. And this is basically representing pretty much the exact same configuration as, as currently. It just adds this box right here. So it adds a finance, a finance authority that can issue bonds and pay bonds to DWR 
Um, and so the market will absorb the bonds directly from DWR as it currently is. So currently, uh, there's five north of Delta contractors. They don't benefit, so they don't pay. That's an important principle on this project that beneficiaries pay. And since you're north of the Delta, you don't benefit from this project, so you don't pay. All of the south of Delta contractors will participate. This is part of the state water project. And just as anything else is that this department does related to the project, um, everyone will participate. In the fall, there were 12 contractors that adopted resolutions of support. And that was very helpful to just make sure we're staying on the right path. And since then, eight contractors have voted to join the Delta Conveyance Design and Construction Authority, which we'll talk about in a moment. And six have voted to join the Finance Joint Powers Authority, which I just mentioned. I do expect that um, that tonight and beyond tonight and through the end of the year, there will be a number of other contractors that sign on to those JPAs, either one or the other or both. So the Delta Conveyance and Design and Construction Authority was formed earlier this year in May, and its only purpose is to complete the design of the project and construct it. And once it's done, it will go away. It gives the project to DWR, and DWR operates it as part of the State Water Project. DWR has also set up what's called a design, or excuse me, Delta Conveyance Office, the DCO. And the DCO, and what we're calling the contractor JPA, DCA, will coordinate to construct and build, make sure we're meeting state stand engineering standards, and make sure that it's a seamless process for the JPA to construct. Four of the five board members have been appointed and are active. They have been um, putting out RFQs for uh, various key positions within the Joint Powers Authority. They will, this uh, entity won't have any direct employees. Employees will come from either um, contractor employees um, on loan or through consultant staff. And um, based on the RFQ schedule and their process and going through interviews and making these hires and finding office space, they expect to be business ready, which means they are up and running by the end of the year. Yeah. Who are the board members and how were they appointed? The board members are appointed per the uh, JEPA agreement, which is the, um, oh man, JEPA. Okay, so this is the agreement between the department and the PWAs that are participating in, in this DCO, DCA arrangement. Uh, there's five board members. One was contemplated always as being a CVP contractor, and we don't have that so Metropolitan is sitting in that seat until that subscriber amount comes through. Uh, Metropolitan holds its own seat as a state water project contractor. Um, Kern County Water Agency holds a seat. That's the one that's currently unfilled as they haven't voted yet. Um, Santa Clara Valley Water District was named in that JEPA, they have a seat. And then there's a fifth member that's at large and it's currently filled by Zone 7. And that's because they were the first um, contractor to be, um, take a vote in order to do that. And then each of them have alternates. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? Um, so the Finance Authority, the second JPA was formed in July of 2018, and it's- I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I had a mute. Um, this is Frank Donato. I have a question. Um, the dollar amount you had, I, I think you said it was, what, 40 million? Annually? Yeah, no, no, no. I mean, for how, how what's, that, what's that based over? How many years? I, it's, I believe, 50 years, a 50 year project. Well, we believe. I mean, that's not the question. The question is, if it's, is it a million dollars a year for us to, to absorb? Is it two million dollars a year to absorb? That's the question I'm asking. Oh, I think Dwayne's, sorry. Uh, Frank, I'll, I'll, I'll be able to provide that information for later in the presentation. Okay. Yeah, thank you. I was giving the number for the overall cost of the project. Um, so going back to the Finance Authority, this was formed in July of this year, and its purpose, like I mentioned before, is to issue bonds um, to the market while a validation action is being resolved. And similarly to the Design and Construction Authority, uh, there's four or five board members have also been appointed. They did submit a um, WIFIA letter of interest to uh, the EPA that provides a federal 
loan program for up to 49% of the cost of a project. Um, we have yet to officially hear back from them. The, there is a deadline to join the finance JPA, and it's December 3rd, and this was five months after the formation of the JPA. And the reason for that is that in order for this to work, um, the bond council and executive director need to be able to understand the members in order to assess credit and understand how to go about issuing bonds. So the idea is to really get a good answer by then so that we can proceed forward. Uh, the, the formation documents do, do not preclude um, people from joining after that date, but it does require a unanimous vote of the membership of the JPA at that point. So another item that um, we are tracking is what we're calling gap funding. The, um, there is a gap between now and when those bonds can be issued in order to support um, the design and construction of the project and it was estimated to be $133 million for a 12 month period. And the gap funding is being provided by various state water project contractors as well as from DWR in their SWERDS fund. Um, the majority of the gap funding is being provided by Metropolitan Water District given their level of participation. Um, and it's gonna ensure that we can keep moving forward in the community design. This gap funding, once there's an initial bond issuance, would be repaid to those that have provided it with interest. So that's um, it for, for the project itself. I'm going to talk next about the contract amendment. So I don't know if there's co pro con excuse me, questions about the project, but I want to pause for a moment there. I'll let you ask him after this, too, but I'll just like to on. I have one question uh, regarding CBP's interest in the project. The net is fronting their portion of the investment. What, can they expect to be reimbursed? Uh, the CBP plan participate with you? So, I, obviously, nothing officially, but what I can report is that there's still, this project was planned for 10 years with involvement from Bureau of Reclamation and Lessons Water District and other. CVP contractors, and I think everyone is in agreement this is the right size project, it's the right project. The issue is that the way that the Bureau of Reclamation bills their contractors is that they, it, it could have turned out that Westlands could have invested in the project and Bureau would not have delivered the water to them because of the priority system in their deliveries. So the very big risk, and that's why the Westland vote went the way it did. So that needs to be sorted out. So I don't want to speak and say, oh, they absolutely support. I can tell you they're still interested. They're trying to sort that issue out. And they've always and continue to say this is the right project. This is absolutely needed for the state of California. Metropolitan would not, um, would not be providing that capacity for free. Um, they would go back here, but um, the option, you can see that they can either sell, sell it or lease it, long-term lease. Um, or they could enter into wheeling agreements for that capacity. But this piece of the capacity in the project, Metropolitan can't use it for the, it doesn't change their water right. So it, it does, it, it can move transfer water, it can do a lot of things, but, um, but it wouldn't be that Metropolitan would be paying for it on behalf of the CVP under any circumstance. But because this is the right size project to build, they are ensuring that we can move forward with the right project. Can I say something real quick here? Um, you know, you keep on saying everybody likes it, and you keep on saying it's the right project. I mean, who, who? I mean, I know you represent, but who are you to say those words? Put those words in my mouth that it is the right project. I mean, or uh, Westland uh, voted against it, but they think it's the right project. I mean, we don't know if this is the right project. I mean, I mean, there's a lot of money been spent, and. Um, now to hear that Nets uh, has a reimbursement agreement, do maybe we should all have a reimbursement agreement? I mean, that's something that they considered by this board. I mean, um, you know, there's a lot of I have a lot of questions. What uh, on your presentation? I wish I was there in person. I'm sorry for that. I'd be out of town for business, but um, I've been following this thing from the minute it was announced. And I mean, how do we know it's right to save water? But I don't hear anything like that. But you know, we'll build some more tunnels. 
those tunnels are not going to supply the next 15 million people coming to California. There's, there's, no, there's no, it's not, not going to happen because there's only so much rainfall that that can drop in a year. So it's a combination of working with these species or whatever they, they, they call them and also working on how are we going to cut back the consumption of water in California for the next 15 million. And I don't hear anything in your presentation saying that is going to be implemented at the same time we're asked to spend, you know, three, four million dollars a year for our constituents here in the Animal Valley. I, I just, I, I need, you know, us to really, I want to bring that up because that, that's a very important thing. I don't care if we spend a hundred billion dollars Where's the rainfall going to come from? Because we're, if we don't have conservation and cutting back the use of water per household in 40, uh, I don't know, what is it, 20, 15 million homes in California, whatever it is, it's not going to matter um, 15, 20 years from now. It's not going to. So we need to figure, I think there needs to be, I think there needs to be a, um, a, a change of attitude that this is the only way to do it because I think it's in conjunction with bypassing or rerouting the pipeline. At the same time, they should be mandating that we're cutting back the use of water. And we're not doing that. That's what that's what's just, I understand. I've not yet heard, in all the programs I've been going to, uh, Aqua and everything else, I don't hear anybody saying we are going to mandate pulling out vegetation that do, doesn't, in, you know, in areas where, like the desert, where we're putting three, four, five acre feet of water on grass that we should not be doing. I haven't heard anything about that yet. So we need to talk about that, I think, as well, when you go back to Sacramento, because that will be helpful for us to understand and also to make it easier for us to vote. Well, uh, directly now, this, this way, uh, what, what you're talking about uh, uh, is the California Water Plan. And the California Water Plan for the whole state has many of the aspects that you have uh, highlighted in your uh, dissertation there and and it does include those what we're talking about is one component in that plan not the whole plan itself uh, we would be happy to provide a briefing to the board on the california water plan with all the components that are associated with that at a future meeting to put this project kind of in context to that larger california water plan which includes conservation and uh, many of the recycled water, and many of the other aspects uh, that, you, that we have available. Well, I hope so, because right now, the only legislation that's been passed in California is Orange County to be able to use tertiary water, blend it in with dry table A water, and put it in the houses. So, I mean, I, you know, I, I, you know, I mean, all I'm saying is, I, I just want to bring this up to the seven-member board that the money's got to come from somewhere. And already, I think it's great that um, Met put in a provision or wants to put a provision in here that they want to be paid back if they fr uh, front load the money on the front end. I think that's a good idea. So how do we join in as part of the program with them? You know, I mean, it's just a thought. Well, I, I think. Uh, we can certainly uh, uh, look into that, uh, Director Donato. Uh, however, uh, uh, I think once you, we get to the balance of the presentation, you, you know, get a get a, a, an understanding of what the scope and the magnitude of AVEX uh, participation costs are. We certainly want to uh, address those first, and then look at uh, ways in which we can uh, uh, participate at a larger level. Okay. Thank you. What's the California Farm Bureau's position on this? Do they have one? I would say, uh, I can't say for certain, uh, but I can tell you from the, uh, from the rural districts in the San Joaquin Valley and the water districts that provide water directly to the farming community and some of the larger growers in, in uh, those areas, uh, they, they, they have indicated uh, to me that they support the project, they think it's the right project to do. They're general managers and, and various directors. Uh, and uh, so they support anything that's going to provide additional water, especially as they address 
there are issues having to do with uh, um, the uh, sustainability, groundwater sustainability act and the need to provide uh, you know long-term water supplies many of them for economic reasons aren't necessarily uh, in a position to to uh, uh, fully fund some of the uh, capital costs but they're more than happy to fund uh, the acquisition costs or the leasing costs of, of this water because that they get a direct benefit that's associated with that. So uh, that's that's just the information I've received in talking to various representatives from the San Juan Valley. Right. And then in that borderline is uh, Sacramento or Stockton? Well, I, I think five. you know I, I think that if you if you you know this is a different project, but I think. The general consensus is is that any uh, uh, additional water projects that can provide reliability or sustainability of water supplies, even north of the delta, are looked on in a favorable light. Uh, the sites project, which uh, is primarily has a significant north of delta uh, participation, where they're actually participating in a, in a pretty large clip in order to do that project because it's in their general area. So uh, it, that just gives you an indication of, of uh, how they feel uh, about you know, supplemental enhancing water supplies where they, uh, where they have those because they understand that uh, to keep their crops and their facilities and their property values that they need water to be able to, to be utilized. So those five that are out of the North of the not considered. Yeah, those are uh, primarily uh, for those are usually urban. Uh, uh, those are urban contractors as opposed to agricultural contractors. Oh, I see. Napa, Solano, City of New York City, County, County. So if they want in, it'll cheapen the, the deal, or they don't receive they, a benefit from it, so they yeah they wouldn't it wouldn't help them. But I, I do know there's no um, opposition from the Farm Bureau. I think they're neutral. I, we could check an official position, but they're not a party opposed. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to talk now about the contract amendment that um, has been discussed for about five months or so. We were negotiating with the department um, every week. And um, what we were looking for is to get everybody to agree, so no um, divergence among the contractor family, make sure that we are able to equitably and reasonably uh, reflect in the costs of water fix, the benefits, so that we're matching that supply of the beneficiary, or excuse me, the, with the cost, that it was transparent, it's stable, so that we weren't causing any major fluctuation in, in um, statement of charges and rates, <coughs> and that it wasn't complex in a way that it was difficult to understand. So these were the things that we went into the contract amendment hoping to achieve. Um, this kind of sets up the stage where um, our objective was to really understand and clarify within the contract some of the water management tools that had been noted by the department earlier, or excuse me, late in 2017, related to transfers and exchanges and DWR, um, and we all wanted to make sure that we were able to, to actually create a mechanism to do a fair cost allocation in part to exclude North of Delta. This is a concept we've been saying for a long time, beneficiary pays, beneficiary pays, so this was really the opportunity to do that. So the contract amendment um, agreement in principle, which is all <coughs> right now, although the, uh, the EIR that the, the department's doing is out on the street right now, has two pieces. It has a water management tools piece, which I consider is those things that are smart water management. When we're talking about how we're going to manage the supplies of the state water project, what pieces of the contract are hindering the ability to do that in the most effective, efficient way, matching supply and demand. The other piece is the California water fix cost allocation piece. So we'll talk about the peak components of the water management tools first. <coughs> so the first piece is related to water transfers. And this just clarifies in the contract that single year and multi-year transfers are all allowed. And that you can also have a transfer package so that you might um, have one contractor providing 
a transfer arrangement, another with another transfer arrangement, and the NBWR would treat that as a transfer. And they can't reclassify it as an exchange, which has some different uh, rules by the department. And I think importantly, um, this contract amendment is reflecting on the fact that all of the project uh, state water project contractors have publicly elected boards who know what your portfolio should be and, and how to manage that. And so this contract amendment affirms that the PWAs entering into transfer agreements are going to be in charge of the terms. They're also going to have to be able to show how the, the how that doesn't impact others and kind of do a little bit more um, I think homework, if you will, to demonstrate the responsible nature of what's being proposed. And as part of that, we would be eliminating the turn back pool, which before, if you weren't going to use all your table A, you would have to go back in a pool and then reallocate it. And here we're saying, no, let the, let the water users that have the contract with the department figure out how best to move the water around. Um, on exchanges, we've clarified exactly what the exchange rates are. It was um, not specified, and it's not specified in the current contract. And so the general theme here is that at the time that two um, or more, supposedly, potentially, contractors agree to enter into an exchange, whatever the allocation on the state water project is at that time would dictate the exchange rate. So as it gets wetter, the exchange rate gets lower. But these are the essentially the rules. So it makes it a lot easier to administer, right? We're not, there's not kind of a, I wonder if the department will allow this. These are now the rules, very clear. So um, related to the transfers and exchanges, these concepts apply. You could be a buyer and a seller in the same year because, for example, you might enter into a long-term transfer for table A that you know you'll need later, but you don't need now, but you might come across a year where you need to, to be a, a purchaser. So the contract is allowing for that and making sure that you could enter into multiple agreements in the same year. There's currently no allowance for Article 21 transfers, but in the contract they are calling out some of the agricultural districts to allow for those transfers, um, with others um, able to do so at the director's approval. This is what we call basic criteria, and this was really important as part of our negotiations because, again, um, the responsibility of ensuring that the transfers are uh, being done in a way that doesn't harm uh, the state water project or its contractors uh, will be essentially documented, and so we want to make sure it's transparent, which we already do right now, uh, but we want to also make sure it's not harming anybody that's not participating in a transfer exchange or create adverse impacts within your service area, you're complying with all laws, and then making sure that as DWR schedules the transfer, it doesn't actually impact operations of the project or the financial integrity of the project. So these are just um, kind of a checklist, essentially, that you would go through if you were to do a transfer exchange to just confirm that. I don't think it's too different than what happens now, but again, we're just clarifying so everyone's on the same page. Um, we are also allowing to, um, the ability to store and transfer water in the same year, again, for the same reason that I just described earlier about being a buyer and a seller, and um, basically being able to transfer what you may have stored, for example, in San Luis, directly to another service area within the state water project contract, um, contract area. So again, tools that just provide kind of common sense water management tools. And that's the purpose of those. I think those are all good. Hopefully you agree. Um, the cost allocation objectives, that second piece of the contract amendment agreement in principle, is meant to exempt the five North Delta contractors from water fixed costs and then use the contract flexibility to allow the participation in the project at a level that works for the contractor. So for example, there are some state water project contractors who would like to see more benefit from water fix than they would otherwise get just from their table A, and there's some that would like to see less benefit and cost really that, than they would get from just taking their table A. And so people are um, using um, the contract to essentially make those adjustments. And um, and doing it in a way that doesn't that continues to um, allow DWR's authority to construct the project while also providing you maximum flexibility to manage your costs and supplies. So the methodology is that um, we basically extract out the five North Delta contractors. 
from and their table A, and then we reallocate the cost of the total project among the 24 South of Delta contractors, just like it would occur uh, if you had the five North of Delta in there. Um, so one of the things we need to make sure, again, this is simple. We're not making things super complex. It really is that simple. That's a, what we're calling the water fix allocation factor. And we just want to make sure that it doesn't, in, it doesn't interfere with any of our um, permits or the, the illegal um, analyses or approaches that we're taking in order to construct the project. So again, it's, I think, pretty straightforward how that's been allocated. And that is the end of my presentation. So I don't know if there's questions on the comment of Lynn or so. Any questions? Please come to the microphone. Ed McKay, Frozen Community Service District Director. Question I have. In this $67 million cost analysis, are cost overruns considered in this? Because I figure, you know, it's going to be about $93 billion to do what you're saying is going to cost $67 billion. The first shovel hasn't been dug yet. Um, yes, I can answer that. So it's $65 billion, not billion, about a um, little under $17 billion is the total cost. That number, that estimate, includes a 35% contingency. So we do think that, um, that that does calculate and incorporate any overruns associated with tunneling. We have looked at a number of tunneling projects uh, that have been completed recently or underway, and we added even more contingency to that to make sure that we would not under budget or under plan for the potential cost of the project. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Thank you. Okay, so I'm on. So now, uh, So, um, and uh, it's, we all want to know what it's going to cost and we'd like to have a real firm number. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it's very difficult to provide uh, certainty as to the California water fix cost. Uh, and, and we'll give you some reasons why that is. Uh, but what we can do uh, for the board is kind of give you an order of magnitude analysis uh, and just give you an idea of what kind of area that we're looking at in, in doing a, a cost allocation here. Uh, these are not, uh, I don't want to pretend that these are completely accurate, but it gets you, gets you in the right ballpark as to what we can anticipate our costs are going to be. Uh, there are two costs uh, uh, primarily for the coupling water fix, that's the capital costs. Uh, and uh, minimum costs and the O&M costs uh, once the project's completed. And uh, it, as with all other uh, state water project costs, those will be contained in our annual BWR statement. So we will uh, get them included in our uh, annual bill that we get. Uh, here's a couple of, uh, uh, couple of assumptions that we uh, made. It's a $16.73 billion project. Uh, the state water share is 67% or 11.148 billion. And then AVEC has a 3.5709% uh, of that. So when you take that uh, and just do the simple math there, uh, you can see that uh, the, the share of that uh, uh, project cost is $398 million, uh, just shy of $400 million. So that's what we're going to have to uh, develop uh, cost factors for. So as in big projects. Hey, Dwayne, 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 yes. okay, real quick. You're going a little fast, so um, slow down. Go back to that slide. So you don't, okay, I see the number, but you don't put over how many years? I'm, I'm going to get to that. Oh, okay. I'll get to that. I'll, I'll show you exactly how we're gonna how we're gonna show that. So, but one of the things, and this is why it's very complicated to figure out exactly what the cost factors are 
when you have a project of this size, uh, there's a series of, and this is how DWR works and how the finance authority will work, will work. they will have a series of bond uh, issuances. So you don't get the full, you know, $16 billion in one bond sale. You're going to do it at, at over the 15 year. Uh, so this is the first one here. A few years later, you'll have a second one, maybe a third one, and a fourth one as it goes through this 15 year construction cycle. You only want the money when you need it not, and not be not being paid. This, this amount is in dollars, so you can see you pay a little bit in the beginning and it ramps up till you get to your ultimate uh, cost factor here with your O&M costs and your capital costs that are involved. So, you know, it's, it, as you can imagine, we don't know exactly what these interest rates are going to be. We don't know exactly what the amounts are going to be, so it's going to be somewhat difficult. But to give us an idea of what those costs are, what we did is we took the hypothetical case. We're just assuming uh, if we used a, a bond issuance, uh, just one bond issuance as a simple, simple analytical tool, assume a 40-year financing between 4 and 5 percent, the annual payment would range between 20 to 23 million dollars per year. So uh, that's what the potential impact would be and when the project's complete in uh, 15 to 20 years. So uh, the revenues, and naturally the next cost is what are the revenues that could offset those costs. And, and we have our high desert water bank that uh, may be able to provide some additional revenue. Um, and then uh, uh, given our, our past history on uh, <coughs> long-term leases and leases that we've used on various terms. We can, uh, if we use just for the sake of argument or, or for discussion, I should say, if we had 20,000 acre feet of our total. We were, uh, we, if we got between $500 uh, for ag up to $1,000 per urban, uh, that would give us between 10 to $20 million per year if we were able to accomplish that. And that would go a long way to trying to offset that 20 to $23 million additional uh, uh, expense associated with California water fix. Um, so that's that's kind of the rudimentary analysis that we're providing for you. To give you an idea, it's, it's going to be in those ranges when it's all said and done 15, 20 years from now. And in essence, what uh, what's going to happen for the agency is we need to develop a financial plan that will, uh, let me go back here, a little bit here. That will go back to well, well, to this point that will provide this level of financing over the next 15 years and get us up to this point. So we will have uh, well, one of the recommendations you'll have uh, from staff is that we start now to develop that financial plan of how we're going to be able to try and offset some of these costs and how that will work for uh, the agency. Yes, Carl. On that graph there, where's the capital cost? This is the capital cost. All of that? This is the capital cost. So when we get to the get to the top of this, you know, in my simplified version, that's twenty to twenty-three million dollars. So uh, and then we went ahead and did a, a little uh, idea of what the OM costs would be. Same kind of, uh, of analysis if we took the OM cost that they've identified, which begins in the 2020-35 period, um, you would have about $64.4 million. AVEX share uh, is 3.5%. That gives us about two to three million dollars per year. And you know, that would uh, uh, since their own OM costs, you know, currently now we use those at, as uh, at water rates as a source. For, for those plan, uh, uh, for those expenditures. So, in kind of in conclusion, um, you know the California water fix is going to have a significant impact on uh, our future state water costs, uh, future revenues from outside water sales, long-term leases, and our groundwater banking could uh, offset those costs. In the end, uh, and this is just Dwayne looking into his crystal ball. Uh, looking at it, I, I see that 
We'll probably use a combination of revenue sources to offset the California water fixed costs. Those could uh, be outside water sales would play a big part, and that's where the contract amendment gives us a lot more flexibility to be able to do that and make that uh, a, a big component of our financing plan. Our outside groundwater banking revenues, uh, water rates, and taxes as uh, uh, various uh, levels of, of uh, revenue that we might be able to use to uh, be able to uh, meet our, our uh, state water contract obligations. So uh, from that, from this point of view, uh, uh, staff is recommending that we accept the principles of agreement. Uh, you have, uh, um, and there's a board order in your packet for that uh, on this uh, water supply contract amendment with DWR. Uh, and we adopt the resolution R18-103, authorizing the general manager to execute and deliver various uh, financing implement, uh, implementation agreements and documents related to the California water fix. What this means is that we would uh, join uh, the uh, finance JPA, the construction JPA, and uh, also uh, provide the uh, gap funding, and then direct staff to prepare a strategy uh, for possible inclusion in the agency's strategic plan, which addresses uh, the agency's costs associated with California water plants. And that, Can I, that concludes the staff report. Go ahead. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Yeah, can, uh, Dwayne Frank, can you go back, please, one slide? Sure. Uh, yeah, right there. Um, so uh, the question I have is, um, I understand outside water sales, outside groundwater banking revenues, mm -hmm. water rates, I understand all that. Taxes. Yes. Taxes on what? Uh, can you explain that to me? Well, as right now, we have a tax rate that, uh, is, uh, that we allocate every year on uh, assessed value of property associated with uh, uh, properties within our service area. Uh, those uh, tax rates uh, uh, can be adjusted on an annual basis to meet needs, and that's one source of revenue that can be utilized. I'm not indicating to you that I'm saying we should, I'm just saying that it is a possibility. The other aspect to, to remember, too, is uh, if uh, in the future uh, the costs become too great, uh, certainly uh, the agency has the uh, ability to sell some of its uh, Table A benefit and others, you know, on a permanent basis, generate certain revenues that are associated with that, deferring those costs on a longer-term basis. So, okay. Um, so I have a question then. Um, on, on the okay. So with, with the, okay. So here's the thing. There, there's there's another component which very few people know about um, um, because you have to go back in history here, last couple of years, that. Uh, Sacramento and everybody doesn't understand that the Antelope Valley, which is, I don't know, uh, what, 2,500, 3,000 square miles, um, the county decided to create a town and country plan that downzoned all the vacant land in the unincorporated area that's made a lot of parcels worthless. The question I would like to see, the other ones I could see that deal with us, but the, the taxes to be put on, the amount of taxes that have to be put on vacant land in our valley would create a d devastating effect because, as we all know, um, that when the does not collect property taxes, they do an estimate, but then they back our taxes out that was supposed to be given to us because the taxpayer didn't pay for it. I can tell you right now, if our agency goes ahead, depending on what the tax is, and we have to double the tax rate, um, because what I just saw those numbers there are astronomical. If we have to if we have to raise it, double the tax rate, the percentages, you will have people, you'll have tens of thousands of parcels of land going back to the assessor's office. And one, we will not get paid because they're not getting paid, and there will not be buyers for that property because they cannot use the property because it's under the town and country. 
So we need to really think of, and when people were like, Metropolitan doesn't have property taxes, it's easier for them, but for us, because we, we um, depend on so much revenue from our taxes, we need to be sure, or be aware, you know, everybody, seven directors there, be aware, but Wayne, and, and I'm not saying you haven't done some of your homework, but this one on taxes, it could be devastating. I mean, I mean it could be. I know it's going to be devastating because right now, uh, people are dump, trying to uh, dump their land right now because they can't utilize it unless uh, they do an environmental impact report to split a piece of land in half. It costs a hundred thousand dollars. So uh, raising the property taxes on something that's a thousand, two thousand a month a year to four, four thousand dollars a year because of the ABAC assessment. Um, you know, that's the thing we have to understand. So I don't understand that part. I don't understand the part, how many parcels of land do we have? And if the board was to elect to increase their tax rate, what would that do to the property owners and the farmers? I mean, the farmers would, I think they'd be devastated um, in Antelope Valley because first of all, water to pay and already, um, you know, excluding the well water with, with the duty. See, we, see, we got a triple, um, uh, dagger right now in the heart. We have a land use problem in the Antelope Valley. We have just got done with a 16 year groundwater adjudication of, of groundwater rights. And now we're looking at maybe possibly uh, the board looking at raising taxes. I, I, I just, I feel uncomfortable with the last one. I really feel uncomfortable. Well, I, I'm, not, I'm not promoting raising taxes, nor am I. Uh, nor am I trying to uh, give you, uh, scare anybody with regards to this, but what I'm saying is that is an option. I don't, uh, I think that you've made some very good points, and that's why uh, staff is recommending that we go through a strategic plan uh, uh, process uh, beginning now over the next several years, because as those costs ramp up, we're going to need to have financial uh, planning uh, ahead of that so that we can offset the costs so that we don't have to raise taxes and uh, keep them as low as possible. And that's where, you know, quite frankly, uh, Frank, I think you can take uh, uh, some, some uh, benefit from your, uh, your uh, water marketing and, and outside water sales, which uh, will go a long way to help uh, deferring these costs. And, uh, so I think that you know we you've set us up for fairly well to be able to uh, avoid uh, raising those taxes uh, with the policies that the board has had with regards to that area. And I have also, a question. I have a question. Okay. Okay. I have a question. So uh, is there? A, I I don't see it here.